Dear all, today we are going to discuss one of the very significant essay written by J.M. Coetzee. And the title of the essay is Apartheid Thing. We are going to focus on the significant ideas and main ideas which are being given by the writer. The writer in the beginning says that when we talk about apartheid, it is very difficult for anybody to justify it. If we implement rational ideas and logic, science, or any kind of humanitarian approach, then it becomes very difficult to digest that how this exploitative system in which people on the basis of skin color were exploited so severely. And how could it is possible that human beings are treated as objects and uh, business. So that is why it is very difficult to understand. Now let us start from the beginning. In the beginning the writer says that uh, if there is an orthodoxy among historians of apartheid today, it is that apartheid was not different in nature from the policies and practices of segregation than uh, it proceed. Furthermore, that apartheid legislation was by no means irrational response to social development which threatened the expectations of Afrikaner and the privilege of white South Africans in general. So if you see the orthodoxy among historians, there are historians, there were historians who supported apartheid and they wrote uh, extremely uh, at length about justifying apartheid. So we cannot implement a rationality. It is obviously it is, it is uh, honestly the irrational response to exploit the, uh, the labor of blacks in favor of privilege of white, white South Africans in general. So that's how their law and this whole work of exploitation of labor resources and the privileges of the African nature uh, was made in favor of a uh, few minorities and white minority who were known as Afrikaner by the legislation. Until and unless it is, it becomes the law. Until and unless the uh, the authority of legislation or uh, law and police, it comes in form of implementing it and controlling the common masses. Uh, then only a, such kind of exploitative system could be uh, implemented. And that same thing happened in uh, apartheid and uh, some of the white liberals uh, who distance apart with this idea of apartheid and they call it hubris or madness uh, it's a kind of irrational response or a madness I mean people were out of mind and what they thought of this and they implemented apartheid so this is how the uh, verbal response of uh, white liberals who actually uh, openly and in public, they do not support apartheid, but they were the biggest beneficiary of the material complicity and exploitation of black labor. And that's what Jem Koetzi is saying here. He says that we're ultimately in this reading attempting little more than to distant, uh, distract attention from their continuing material explicit in exploitation of uh, black labor. That's what the idea of uh, white minority uh, liberals are supposed to uh, presenting themselves, but which is absolutely wrong. And uh, then he says that uh, in the history, a kind of madness and uh, irrationality and illogic until and unless in the writing of history, a madness or irrationality and illogic is implemented, then only such kind of ideas could be accepted. And that's how when we talk about self-interest, and that's how, uh, when we talk about self-interest, uh, uh, for the self-interest, uh, I think one has to sacrifice rationality and logic. So uh, one has to choose uh, self-interest rather than uh, uh, thinking about rationality and thinking about everyone. It is not possible. So Koethi says that, but to call apartheid made by no means to imply that the liberal capitalist segregationism that preceded it 
it was sane. It makes sense of kind, indeed, to argue that both were mad. Rationality in economic. Self-interest do not have to be the same thing. So, we cannot put these ideas all together. The moment you can't be rational as well as uh, you are not talking about your self-interest. If you are talking about your self-interest, then you cannot be rational. You have to be ir irrational. Uh, so, that's how it goes on. And the most significant aspect, uh, J.M. Koichi says that, uh, it was in the benefit of, uh, I mean, you know, it was difficult to implement apartheid uh, because uh, it, 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 it took a lot of efforts. It took a lot of sacrifices implementing law, uh, that implementing the policies of segregation, then using manpower or police power, administrative power to separate people, to control people, to control resources, to snatch resources even. It was difficult, but it finally paid off. So he says, the theorist of apartheid justified the doctrine on the ground that it was in the long-term interest of whites. Apartheid demanded sacrifice. Sacrifice in terms of implementation of law, uh, then using police forces, administrative policies, making administrative policies. They say it, but in the long term, such sacrifices would pay off. Uh, and then he gives the example of police detective turning to the most obvious place for uh, the hidden letter. And uh, that's how we see this same article. We see this same article is actually talking about the caste system and how this when uh, in in India, the caste system, because uh, I mean, uh, there are some statements which are being made by uh, this uh, Jim Koizzi. And he says that apartheid, a dream of purity, but an impure dream. Because whatever the exploitative system existed in the world, uh, they had certain common tactics. And these tactics are uh, either using the notion of purity and pollution. And uh, this is, you know, in, in terms of talking the uh, benefits and upliftment of the masses. I mean, the common people for the development of the common people. So, uh, and uh, this uh, taking the sanctity of religious institutions and implementing it through law and making it a, a acceptable norm in the society. So any law which is being implemented, which is in the benefit of certain people, and then how it work in the society, it, it is given sanctity and acceptance in the masses, in the, in the society. Religious institutions play a, a great role in sanctifying this, justifying it. And uh, then... Uh, purity and pollution. You know, some people are dirty, they are unhygienic, they are unclean, they are like this, their race is bad, their color is bad. So these are all certain uh, sanitary, sanitary uh, concepts are unhygienic concepts are associated with them. Uh, it, it same thing happened with gender. Uh, women are also called unclean. I mean, when a woman is going uh, through menstruation, then she is called un unclean. But uh, if any woman, any girl who is not going through menstruation, she cannot have children, she cannot produce children, she cannot become mother. So how could it be this logic is, is unjustified? But because it worked in the favor of patriarchy, where a patriarchy, the system of patriarchy can utilize woman's body and her labor. And she can use it, use, uh, the patriarchy can use woman as a labor and a uh, the, uh, as a help. So in this way, these certain notions of purity and pollution, and that is how, howsoever it is irrational, howsoever it is draconian, but it's, it is implemented through legislation, through law, through uh, social acceptance, and through uh, religious institutions. So that's how, and then he says that, uh, he says that, that the people who invented and implemented apartheid, the people who thought of implementing and inventing apartheid. And uh, there is no evidence. We do not find any evidence in the history that anybody is accepting this, that, okay, we had this idea in the mind that we want to implement apartheid just because there is a clear understanding or motive to use labor uh, and resources of black blacks. Uh, uh, downtrodden, untouchables, women, and uh, 
minorities, whatever it is there. So no one is accepting. And here, uh, Jim Koizzi is making a very significant state uh, statement. He says that until and unless you go into the history and where you will find that, is there any confessional history? Confessional history. Anybody who is confessing, for example, uh, Kronze, Geoffrey Kronze, whose four books, uh, who has written four books from 1945 uh, to 48, and uh, this the National Party of Africa, uh, which was supported by the Afrikaners and the white minorities, uh, most of the ideas of apartheid and implementation of apartheid, uh, legislating it uh, was drawn heavily. So, uh, Koizzi is questioning here. Koizzi asked that, uh, do you find anywhere uh, written by Geoffrey Kronze? He accepts that uh, this was the basic idea or he accept, he confessed that this, the, the primary idea of implementing apartheid was to exploit a black labor and uh, resources of Africa or Asia or India. So, uh, is anybody accepting it? This kind of writing we'll never find until an analysis we find that there is a confessional history. There is no confessional history. So, what Je uh, Geoffrey Kronze, uh, who is what he is writing, uh, Koizzi is actually assuming it as a confessional history, although it is not there. The writer himself is not saying that he is confessing. But uh, what he is saying is taken. And the most significant thing, Koizzi says that if you read uh, Geoffrey Kronze, then you will find that we have to understand what he is saying. That is direct. But uh, the more significant is what he is not saying. What he is not uh, uh, trying to say. So we have to read between lines, then only we can understand. Uh, further, he says that uh, when we talk about this illegal Bantu, or it was an educational uh, law which was implemented in 1953 to segregate the education system of blacks and white. So all these things were there in the minds of the people. And uh, here, Koizzi uh, uh, says, that the notion I will explore here is that the man who invented and installed apartheid, or at least some of the men, some of the time, were possessed by demons. Pinning the blame for apartheid or demon, I, as I realize, pinning it nowhere at all. Nevertheless, if madness has a place in life, it has a place in history too. The indifference of South Africa, African historiography to the question of madness, and the tacit consensus in the social senses, sciences that while madness like what used to be called the illegal Bantu may be conceded to have place in society. This is ontologically a place apart, a non-place that does not uh, entitle madness to a party in history, should arouse nothing but mistrust and make us uh, redouble rather than uh, abate what efforts to call up and interrogate the demons of the past and uh, then he says as an uh, 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 when we talk about the religious sanctity of apartheid or caste system then he says as an episode in historical time apartheid was casually over determined it did indeed uh, flower out of self-interest and greed but also out of desire and denial of desire in its greed it demanded black bodies in all their physicality in order to burn up their energy as labor i repeat this is very significant statement please note it uh, in its greed it demanded black bodies in all their physicality in order to burn up their energy as labor in its anxiety about black bodies it also made laws to banish them from sight apartheid did not understand itself and could not afford to understand itself its essence from the beginning was confession, a confession it displaced widely or around itself. Contemporary historical scholarship on apartheid suffer from self-imposed limitations. It approaches apartheid from the outside, treating only uh, its working in the world. Churchmen call apartheid a sin, but uh, not because it was a crime of huge dimensions. The notion of crime has an inbuilt weakness. Crime are defined by the victor and apartheid was not a victor. But because it set for itself the task of reforming, that is to say, deforming 
and hardening the human heart. Apartheid will now listen carefully. Uh, crime are defined by the victor, and apartheid was not a victor. But it, but because it set itself the task of reforming, that is to say, deforming and hardening. Wherever you find that in the name of uh, upliftment and the uh, development of the masses, such kind of terms are used: uh, reforming or uplifting the so society and making their economic development, which is not there. The real intention is deforming and hardening the human heart. Apartheid will remain a mystery as long as it is not approached in the layer of heart. If we want to understand it, we cannot ignore those uh, passages of its treatment that reach us in the heart uh, speech of autobiography and confession. So this, this is very significant. And what he says that until and unless people come out and simply say, so we have to, if we have to, understand apartheid, let's get into autobiographical reading. Let's get into confessional history where those minds who implemented the thought of making this law, using the uh, black labor and exploit the resources of blacks and deprived, they had clear intention in their mind that they are using, uh, they are using these tactics and laws to exploit them and to get, to give benefits to some uh, certain chosen. That's how we have to move towards autobiography, confessional writing, and maybe the personal notes of the writers. It is in this spirit that I approach the writing of Geoffrey Cronje. I treat them as a confession, not as a rep repentant confession far from it, but as confession of belief. A credo all the more revealing of being full of ignorance and madness. In what now seems old-fashioned innocence, Cronje falls into a delirium of writing with a lack of reserve, a lack of prudent self-censorship, quite foreign to his successor in the academic bureaucratic castle. And those people who were actually determined to implement it as a law, they made a academic bureaucratic castle. I mean, those who, the minds who thought of implementing and making uh, apartheid as a law, they, they were from the academic bureaucratic castle. He helped to build. In the delirium, we catch glimpses of apartheid nakedly copied in thinking itself out. But we can share these glimpses only if we reach the text, follow the raving from inside. If we inhabit the part of ourselves, Cronje's position as writing subject. In reading him, we must make an effort of projection, entering his language, listening closely to what he says and even more closely to what, the, what he does not say is afraid of saying. So if you have to understand apartheid and the mind behind the apartheid, what he says, uh, Jem Koiji says beautifully, Karanji's position as writing subject in reading him, we must make an effort of projecting, projection entering his language, listening closely to what he says and even more closely to what he does not say is afraid of saying. What Karanji does not address in his text what he turns away from is the desire of mixture. Yet to mixture, it's his mind obviously returns. What does mixture mean to him rather than try to pin it down? I prefer to allow the concept to float in its endlessly attractive yet repulsive allure. Itself a self-contradiction, self, itself a mixture. It is mixture and the desire for mixture. That is the secret enemy of Geoffrey Cronje and his fellow Knights of Apartheid. So... Uh, those people who were actually determined to implement apartheid, uh, Koizhi called them fellow knights of apartheid. Fellow knights of apartheid. I, I repeat, fellow knights of apartheid. The befalling force that must be thwarted, imprisoned, shut away. Apartheid is a dream of purity, but an impure dream. Apartheid is a dream of purity, but an impure dream. Apartheid is a dream of purity, but an impure dream. It is many things, a mixture of things. One of the things it is, is a set of barriers that will make it impossible for the desire to mix, to find fulfillment. My concern is thus less with Geoffrey Cronje himself, a man of no great historical importance, than with his madness and with the question of how madness spread itself or is madness to spread through the so social body. More generally, it is with the uh, reinsertion of madness into history. So, uh, apartheid is a madness into history. 
and what Geoffrey Cronzy doesn't say, is afraid of saying, is more significant. Let us come to the autobiography and confessional history. Then only we have to understand it. Thank you so much. Kindly subscribe my channel, Success Matrix.